you so much for having me. This is a double whammy. If you guys joined the morning, I gave a, a brief discussion about how we just want to even approach the topic of preventing and countering violent extremism when it comes to the online space and sort of the roles around what should tech companies be looking to do and support, what should civil society be looking to do and support, um, and how we can best amplify and really upscale and optimize what each of our sectors is doing. So as AARO and Aaron mentioned, I am from Facebook, but I'm specifically on the counterterrorism and the dangerous organizations policy team. And what that means is our team is responsible of helping define in our policy and make it transparent what we mean when we say terrorism or violent extremism or broader dangerous organizations. And that could be nonviolent groups, but that are based on hatred and, and are organized around a hateful mission and that should also be banned from our platform. Now it's one thing to have a policy and it's another thing to then try to carry out that policy at scale. And we mentioned in the opening session that that's extremely difficult to try to get at all the variance and nuance of how this manifests all over the world. But in this session, we wanna be really targeted. And what I'm going to try to do is talk through maybe 20 minutes of presentation of just giving really focused top tips and tools about how to approach countering violent extremism online. And some of this is gonna be focused on Facebook specific tools, Instagram specific tools, but really a lot of what I'll be discussing is agnostic to any one platform. So the tools might be Facebook or Instagram specific, but the concepts and approaches and a lot of the tips around online content definitely are not specific to any one platform. And so I think that will help guide us. And then we're gonna go into a 30 minutes where I'm gonna give you examples of concrete real world counter speech or counter narratives that exist. And you're gonna go into breakout sessions with these four different examples. And each one of the groups will take one of those examples and just tear them apart, deep dive, and figure out as much as you can about them to then come back and use that as an exploratory final 30 minutes of us detailing what does that mean? What were you able to find? What would you think of that counter speech? Was it successful? What could you garner? Is it sustainable? Is it not? And by kind of deconstructing existing counter speech, it might make you reflect on how you're developing counter speech, how you might then put yourself in somebody else's shoes of if they came across your content, if they were to dig around what your initiative is, what would they find and what would they think of it? So to kick this off, I'm going to share some slides to start with just about enforcement of if you are in the online space, the fact that you will be coming across what we consider probably bad or even violating content. Um, and so I think that's important for us to first and foremost say, what are some of the tools that might exist for you? I don't know, Vesna, can you tell me if you see my screen and if you see it as a full screen or if you see the next slide as well? I can see it as a full screen. Great. So just really quickly, it is helpful to say if you do find bad violated content on Facebook or any other platform, it really does help to report. And I think in some of the Q&A in the last session, people mentioned maybe you're flagging what you think is hate speech and it's not being removed. So another follow-up to this will be if you have specific trends you're seeing, maybe follow up through Aaron and the TechSoup team so that we can see if maybe you're catching on to trends that we don't know about. But as a reminder, I always tell people that if you do see violating content, report it. So you can report a comment, a profile, an event, content itself, but all the way down to the granular comment within a post, you can report, which I think is important because sometimes a post might not be violating, but a comment underneath it might be hate speech, attacking the person or group that posted something in the first place. So there's a little button that will say report, and usually you'll get some options, and it allows you to qualify for the platform why you're reporting it. Is it because it's annoying? Does it have to do with hate or violence? Is it spam? And that allows us to triage that to the right team that's going to have that subject matter expertise in order to assess that content. And that is language specific and that is subject specific. It is also completely confidential when you report this sort of thing to social media companies. So even if a government requested data on who reports what, that's not something we ever disclose. It is protected under privacy regulation as well. Um, and it also shouldn't matter if something is flagged more than once. So sometimes there are these theories that if you flag something a thousand times, then no matter what, it will come down. And that's not the case. Flagging something once is enough to review it. 
Um, and the amount of times you flag it does not necessitate whether or not it will come down. And then behind the scenes, really how we know about bad content, how we can act upon it, is a combination of our online community, plus our internal teams that have to have language and culture knowledge, plus some of the machine learning and tooling that we used. And I touched on this in the morning session, but some of the things that we use to help us make decision making is around tooling and artificial intelligence. And I would qualify that by saying, people will always be better at nuance and adversarial shifts, while the tooling can help us get to scale and speed. So we can use things like photo and video matching technology so that the same piece of bad content doesn't keep coming back on. And again, part of the questions this morning, we do see adversarial shifts very quickly in that space. So maybe a bad actor will try to change the color pixelation or augment the image slightly into a different format so that it avoids our photo and video matching. So we're having to get better at that. But we're also working on things like audio detection, detecting recidivist accounts, so accounts that keep coming back by the same user, cross-platform collaboration. So if something comes down on Facebook, making sure the Instagram equivalent of it also comes down. And just language processing, understanding how and why people share what might be dangerous content. And increasingly for all the tech companies behind the scenes, we are having to have these really diverse teams. So people not with tech backgrounds, not coming from Silicon Valley, but more so people with law enforcement backgrounds, human rights backgrounds, which is really important to make sure we're not over censoring, um, but also different cultural perspectives to make sure that we're not inherently creating biases within some of our policies. So my team alone operates on four different time zones around the world and has people coming from all these different backgrounds so that when I say, well, this is how I define hate speech or this is how I define terrorism, they might give me an example from Sub-Saharan Africa or from Singapore or France that makes us question if that's really the right position to be having that policy because our policies are meant to be global. So what works in one country needs to work in another. That is a near impossible task, but it's one that we're constantly evolving around. And again, like we said this morning, I can take down all the content I need to, and it's a constant whack-a-mole approach, but really to counter extremism, it's about replacing that content with better ideas, with less hate-based groups and organization, and providing alternative pathways for individuals that might otherwise go down a hate-based pathway. So this is again where we do need partnerships, and these partnerships are constantly building out all over the world, and that is about providing research background on counter speech, developing training for how to deploy counter speech, and then creating uh, action-oriented awareness around that counter speech. Now, I'm gonna say counter speech, but please know that I'm using it synonymously with counter narratives and alternative narratives. So we can go down a definition rabbit hole, I'll try not to. But in essence, we're talking about any content that naturally pushes back on hate speech and extremism in all its various forms. So we know that counter speech happens every day on Facebook and across different social media platforms without us doing anything. It's just naturally and organically being created by different individuals and activists all over the world. And what does that mean in terms of best practices and what works? So I'll talk you through some of what works. Any research I mention in this, I will show you the websites where to find them open access afterwards. A lot of this is available on counterspeech.fb.com but some of the research shows things that are important for activists to know. One is that you do not have to be like for like the amount of quantity of counter speech compared to the quantity of hate speech. So hate speech often has a machine gun approach where lots of content might be put out there by a group, but usually very few pieces of that content go viral or get to the right audiences. A lot of it is just put out into space. If you are consistent with your messaging, have fewer counter speech pages or posts with slightly less output perhaps on average per day, but have more consistency and are focused more on engagement, it goes farther than the hate speech focused pages. This experiment was done looking at far right extremist pages and it showed that when counter speech was consistent, provided outlets for engagement, and might have had less content, but more focus on engagement, it went 10 times further than some of the, the pages that we might have considered to be hate-based and focused. 
So that's a reminder that all is not for naught. It does not have to be an eye for eye of quantity. It is more about the quality of the messaging that you are putting out there and the consistency. Why show this slide? I'm gonna show two slides that overlap with my last talk, but it is also important. You should ask yourself three questions before you launch any counter speech. It's what is the form that you're taking to convey your message? Is it through an image or video? Is it through a question and answer? How are you getting someone to engage through the form itself? What is your tone? Are you being humorous, sarcastic, serious? Are you trying to convey uh, certain emotions through a cognitive opening, which could also be done through an image or video? And then who is the most effective speaker? Based on who you're trying to reach, who is going to be credible? And what we found was in another piece of research done by um, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, we found that nobody, surprisingly, nobody likes to be told off. Nobody likes to be told that they're wrong. And we tend to sometimes want to lecture people saying, okay, your hate-based message is wrong. And telling people they're wrong never opens a pathway for dialogue usually. So casual tones, being authentic with people, initiating them on common ground, finding a common point, and then pivoting them towards the point where you might disagree is a better way than just openly starting with a disagreement. And who you're trying to reach will define some of your metrics of success. So this is a repeat slide as well, but this also just shows the number of people you're trying to reach. So if you're trying to reach wider society, you can expect larger reach metrics, but maybe smaller engagement metrics. Whereas if you're really trying to reach those core people that are inside a violent extremist group, you're trying to reach a very small audience, but your success will be based on engagement metrics and that deeper and elongated engagement with those individuals to try to see if you have a theory of change. Now, broadly speaking, for anything you want to put out socially, this is more of a media suggestion than anything else. Keep your tone conversational. That tends to go further. Keep it feeling authentic. So don't put the falsehoods and shields of a brand around something if it can feel authentic. Authenticity, especially in violent extremist communities, goes a long way. So almost having honesty as a best policy and not misleading people is going to work. Keep your content visual. So photo and video content goes 60 to 80% further than text only content. Keep your message simple. So some NGOs have entire manifestos of things you wanna say, but realistically, people don't have big attention spans online. So take the 100 things you wanna say and put them in 100 different posts. And maybe you use the post online to pivot people to better offline resources. So keep it simple. And then lastly, keep it timely. So you have to question, why does someone want to care about your campaign today? Especially when you're trying to challenge something like hate or extremism or misinformation, just think through the person on the other side that thinks, I need to do my taxes, I need to do my work, I need to respond to emails, do I really wanna deal with hate speech today? So think through why it will matter to them today, either tying it to a real world event, tying it to a month, tying it to, news articles that make it relevant to them. So these are things of ways to stay timely so that people will actually respond now instead of just scrolling past and saying, okay, I'll deal with it tomorrow. The other thing I always wanna flag is that despite best intentions, we want you to stay safe with your activism. So you really should question what your appetite for risk is you don't wanna be engaging with an actual violent extremist group that might have retaliation tactics if that's not what you're up for. Um, so think about your personal safety for engagement and your outreach, as well as the people that you're net networking with that might be considered vulnerable individuals. Also think through offline security and safety. So if I'm going to make an event about countering extremism, I probably don't want to highlight the exact date, location, timing, and organizers openly on public social media, and unless I think that's benign. So I might wanna think through that. I might wanna give the date and time and rough location, but not exact location. And then for people that are SVP, maybe I give the exact venue. Um, there are offline security risks depending on the type of group you're countering, and you should know the type of group you're trying to counter in order to assess that. And then just understand that you know online and offline, there are going to be limitations with your activism based on ethical considerations, 
are you best placed to engage with this group that you might consider at risk? Um, how much personal information are you putting out there? And what's your ultimate impact of your work? So again, just some things to question as you start forming your online content, think through, do a phishing exercise, put in your name and the organization and see how far you can get of finding publicly accessible information that might lead to your personally identifiable information and question whether or not you wanna share that. Um, there are a range of, of links that I can share after this, but one is just facebook.com forward slash safety, and you can do a privacy checkup. So you can actually have it go through the different settings and highlight to you where you might wanna increase your privacy settings. And that's something that I do periodically as well. Now for your measurement and evaluation, when you do start launching campaigns, it's important to know that you have an entire cheat sheet. So I'm sure some of you already have pages and maybe have already engaged with this, but really that insights button on your page, so this button here, is crucial to kind of giving you all the background information to assess whether or not your campaign is doing well or not. And through that button, you can basically see in an overview what your campaign is doing, what your content is doing on your page. And so if you put any ad spend on, even the smallest amount of ad spend, it will take you through and it will talk through your reach and engagement. Importantly, it'll also talk you through how many people are seeing it on their normal computer screen versus contacting it through mobile devices. Now that's crucial because you might make some beautiful content that looks excellent on a 13 inch screen. And then I take that and I put it on a three inch by two inch screen and all of a sudden I've lost the message. Um, and if it's a video, how are you making sure that if I'm scrolling on a phone, that it has subtitles because maybe I don't have my headphones in, so I should still be able to know what it's saying. So things like that. The other thing on this is that um, when I scrolled to the top, it said organic versus paid reach. So even if you put 10 euros on a piece of content, it will show you how much that paid reach boosted you outside of your echo chamber, so outside of the people that already followed you. And then the organic reach is there as well. And that's important because if you are just paying for content to go somewhere and it has no organic reach above what you paid for, it means it's not naturally trending. And so the best way we can look at successful content is that a little paid ad spend, and I'm really just talking small amounts, will boost you outside of the people you already know because it's no longer just organic content. But once it boosts, if it's actually tractionable content, it should have an increase in organic reach because then after the ad spend, people will start sharing it and engaging with it and sharing it further. So that is one way to kind of think through if your campaign was successful. The other thing is just on that audience insights page, you can get an idea of who's engaging, what age roughly they are, whether they are male or female, so some of the demographics, and then you can go through and see you know, page likes, some of the location targets and basic activity. So that's worth looking through depending on how you're trying to target. And then to do with that, everyone wants to think that the big reach is always success and you think you wanna reach everyone, but realistically for counter extremism, you're probably wanting to reach a very select group of audiences. You know, if you are, trying to counter white supremacy and neo-Nazism in Germany, already that has told me, okay, it is a German demographic. It is a very specific demographic that is largely male, although a lot of females increasingly as well. And then I might wanna think through likes, interests and behaviors related to that group to target my ads. So I might wanna put in there mixed martial arts as an interest. Um, there's lots of people in mixed martial arts that are not into the neo-Nazi or white supremacy movement, but increasingly there is a white supremacy group that likes those movements. So the more you know the group you're trying to target, the more you can work backwards onto likes, interests, and behaviors to try to see how to use those ads marketing tools in a more innovative way to reach that audience. The other thing is that a lot of you might not have time to be on social media every day and uh, it's not my job to push you to be on it more. So you might only have once a month where you dedicate yourself to social media for your NGO or for your activist work. And you might wanna develop in one day a series of 
memes or short clips of videos, and you can bulk upload those through Power Editor, and then you can decide when they launch. So you don't have to be there to click the button, but you can bulk upload and preset when they should launch on your page. And that might save you a lot of time, or maybe that's something you have an intern do, um, and it's easier. So these are just ways to make it a little easier for you to be consistent about when things come out, but not have to physically be there to press the launch button. You guys might also want to think about timing of when you launch content. So if you launch it at 3 in the morning for your target audience, they're probably not going to see it by the time they wake up. And you might just think through timing a little bit. For example, I know selfishly, if I'm just posting something towards friends and family, I know that I want to post it at about 4 or 5 PM London time because that's when people are getting off work in London. My friends in Central Europe are just getting home, which is usually when they scroll. And it's about 9 a.m. in California where my family's based. And it's about lunchtime in New York. So that hits everyone at moments that I know that they're probably gonna be online. So that's a vanity metric, but you might wanna think through timing just to make sure you're hitting that audience because there's a lot of noise online as well. So just a few more tips, um, and then I wanna open it up to questions. But to start with, if you've never done Facebook Live, here's some examples of how I've seen NGOs and activists use it. You can use Facebook Live or whatever live, whether that's Twitter through Periscope or YouTube Live. You can do questions and answers with experts. You can cover your perspectives on breaking news that you might wanna put out there. Um, you can do behind the scenes about things that your team is working on. Uh, if you're more involved with artists, there are performance series done through live. And the point is to have a more active engagement with a wider audience that can't be there in person. And especially during pandemic and increased quarantines, that might be of use to you. So lastly, these are the things you should think about before you even develop the content. What's your goal? Who are you trying to reach? What does that mean the format should be based on your goal and who you're trying to reach? And those things should indicate to you what you consider success. Does that mean you're aiming more for reach? Does that mean you want more engagement? How are you measuring engagement? And then if you want, this is an interesting, it's called Campaign Toolkit. Um, I think it's just on, I'll, again, I'll share these URL links so that you don't have to have them at hand. But the campaigntoolkit.org is available in five different languages. I think it's in English, French, German, Arabic and I believe Swahili. And, and it's not just for Facebook. It also covers Twitter, Microsoft, and YouTube. And it talks you through things like how to approach your campaign. You can begin to input uh, things around your campaign as well as your goals. And it will have a lot of links to all the different security sites for all our different large platforms. And it will talk you through ways you might want to approach it. So it's a DIY help kit for campaigns that are trying to take a stand against hate, extremism, and division. So that might be a useful link for you guys. And then if I'm at the point of your day where your caffeine is running low and you don't remember much of what I said, two of the really good links to go to, socialgood.fb.com really helps talk you through things like how to use ads tools, how to make pages, events, how to use those insight tools that I talked about. And then counterspeech.fb.com highlights some of the programs we run, but also has a link to resources, which include some of the academic articles I was talking about that talk about measurement and evaluation and best practices. So with that, I'm going to stop for questions before we go back and give some examples and go into a breakout session. Um, so, there we go. I think I've stopped sharing. And if Aaron is on or Vesna, I'd love to know what the best way to do q and A. I I don't mind people shouting out, but we also have this event chat if people want to throw questions in there as well. Hello again. Uh, yeah, I would say whatever people are comfortable with. Uh, I mean, Aaron, if that's fine with you, then go ahead and share your audio and video. I think for engagement reasons, uh, we would definitely love to see people's faces, but it's not a requirement. Be joining here momentarily. Perfect. There we go. Hey there. Hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. But uh, I wanted to ask you something. Like you talk about how to counterface the the problem of uh, the, like hatred and so on. But don't you think the, the main problem is uh, all the website and the fake news that are spreading all over Facebook? Um, 
I mean, how do you think we can face these kind of problems? Because I can also, like I can talk with people, I can try to uh, spread my message and like uh, in, in a very fashionable way, like with the conversational tone, authenticity and so on. But uh, if they reply to me that they have this kind of uh, fake website that give them like a fake news, how can I reply? Like, is it working? Do you have some suggestion? I and mean, thank you very much. Sure. Well, you, you threw out a term that doesn't actually have an agreed upon meaning to start with, but there is an entire team. So I'm on a counterterrorism and dangerous organizations team. There's an entire team on misinformation, what we'd call disinformation and misinformation. Um, and this is a really tricky space. So increasingly, we do a couple of things. One is that for things like news or things that people are sharing around news, when people flag things for being misinformation, we channel them to third party fact checkers. And this is important because I don't think that anyone on this call, although correct me if I'm wrong, thinks that a private social media company should be the arbiter of truth. So Facebook shouldn't tell you what truth is. That's a very slippery slope and a very dangerous one. So when people, uh, when we see a certain quota of people flagging things for misinformation, we triage it to third party fact checkers that are usually attached to mainstream news entities that have fact checking bodies, whether that's the Associated Press or elsewhere. And there's partnerships all over the world that are expanding around that. And when they label it as saying, yes, this has, this is false. So this is not a theory or a speculation, but this is false. We label that content that says that it's been labeled by a third party fact checker and it's transparent and you can click through and see how the fact checking program works. And so we're increasingly labeling content as being related to misinformation where it will say that this has been labeled by a fact checker. Now, this we also know that there's a lot of things that are pretty difficult to verify. And increasingly, as you mentioned, there are third party sites that might just they're not belonging on Facebook. They're completely independent third party sites, but people share links to it on Facebook. So we can still label those links. In some cases, we actually black hole those links so that they're not allowed to be shared on Facebook if we think that they're inherently violating. But this takes a lot of partnerships because it's not first of all, we're not psychic. So we don't always know what a third party link leads to. And then secondly, it has to be done in partnership. So again, Facebook should not be the one that is telling you what truth is. And so those third party fact checking, that is all over the world. So there's an, a team that deals with partnerships in Asia, a team across Europe, a team across North America, Latin America, and that will have different um, language support. But I can send some links along that tell you more about the fact checking program. The second thing is how to then push back on that. And that's a really separate question because there's gonna be a lot that perhaps can't be labeled at scale with the way that things spread. Um, and there are tools and tactics to push back on misinformation. So one is if your NGO actually has better information or can link to alternative perspectives or alternative news, but you have to build credibility with the people you're trying to challenge. So if I just approach somebody that I disagree with or that I think is wrong and tell them that, it's not going to start a conversation. Um, so there are ways to post and pivot and provide further details. And usually it starts with a common ground of, that's an interesting perspective. To my knowledge, that did not, that's not what I've heard. I've heard this and it's about creating a discussion. So if you're willing to create a discussion, now there are points and I can share some documents. The Online Civil Courage Initiative created a really good handbook on when to engage, when to report and when to not engage because sometimes you're engaging in a space where they want to attack you. Um, and that's probably not the space that's worth engaging in. It's really in those early, uh, early spectrum of people questioning facts that you probably have the best in, unless you're a disengagement entity. There are NGOs that are made of former extremists um, that are disengagement focused, that have practitioners that disengage people from embedded movements, but most NGOs are better in the prevention space. So that's like, that's a little bit tip of the iceberg to what you're saying, but I can definitely send along a lot of links that give more details about how you as a third party can engage. Um, and I do see 
I do see some questions coming in. Maybe yes, that can help me ask some of those. Since I'd yes, like there are a lot on. of comments upon what you are saying. So I think this is a great idea to share with uh, with, with some more documents because there is about like uh, languages and uh, fact checkers, how many of them are working uh, in, in one country or how many cover what, what kind of amount of population, etc. But there is a question from uh, Deborah. Um, apart from the standards regarding format and so on, how do you monitor how your content, content is actually based on positive values and doesn't risk to fuel polarization and further hate? Right. So, I mean, I would tell everyone that you can go and just look up, you can even Google Facebook community standards, and it's a lot that's open and transparent. So I know that pretty much nobody except usually one lawyer on a call will have actually read terms of service. And that's why we have community standards because community standards is the more human way of discussing what a policy is and what that implies for what might be removed. So when you have community standards, I will say that we openly give a definition of what we mean by terrorism. Um, and that's based on behavior. It's not based on any one religion or ideology, for example. It's based on a group that is carrying out premeditated, attempted or accomplished violence that is aimed at causing a political or ideological goal um, and that is intent on creating real world harm. Those groups, when we see attacks like that, we immediately would label it as terrorism. And that doesn't matter if it's a white supremacy motivated attack like what we saw in Halle, Germany, or an incel misogyny-based violence attack, like what we saw in Glendale, Arizona recently. Um, and so it's not, it's not focused on any one government list, although we also do look to government lists. And I would say for hate speech, it's very clear, this is not about removing content that might offend you. And I wanna make that clear because there's a lot of offensive content that might not break a policy. But when it breaks a line of hate speech, where you see attacks based on protected categories about people, that is very different than somebody just annoying you. And we are not there at scale to just take down any content that annoys you or is a bit extreme or brings up controversial ideas. We cannot build a scalable policy about that. We have to look at targeted attacks, potential real world violence, hate, misinformation leading to real world harm, because we're not just talking about any lie, we're talking about misinformation that might have xenophobia tied to it. We're talking about misinformation that might cause real world harm, or that might take away from a democratic process like elections. Um, so I think that's important to remind you, we're not here to just remove content because you don't like it. We're here because it has to violate a very specific policy line. Now this is an impossible task. So I remind people that our policies are always evolving. And one of the things that just changed yesterday, which I, I mentioned in the early morning call is Facebook finally took the stance to fully ban all Holocaust denial. Before a lot of Holocaust denial naturally came down under different policies like um, mockery of victims or um, hate speech towards protected categories. But now we took the fuller step to have full Holocaust denial banned. That was a long time coming because it's about looking at that at scale. So our policies do evolve and shift and it's usually based on conversations with civil society groups to better understand how hate is manifesting and how real world harm is being created. But it, it has to be in partnership because again, a private tech company alone should not be defining this very nuanced and adversarial space. Um, I know, and I know people have asked about language. So I will say just a couple of things on that. Um, you know, not only do you need language, but you need completely embedded cultured language. So I speak French pretty fluently. I speak Hungarian kind of decently. I should not be looking at French or Hungarian content because unless I am a local native speaker, I am not going to understand the nuances of satire, of humor, of hate speech, of xenophobic language. And so when we hire around language, it has to be localized and it even has to be diversified. So if I hire a Russian language speaker, we might need a different language speaker to focus on Russia geographically and Ukraine geographically, because we also don't want inherent biases in how language might play out. Um, it is on five different time zones that we have language support so that we can cover 24 seven, especially around escalations. And there are over 35,000 people full time at Facebook that are just on the safety and operations teams. So that's largely people responding to real world harm and or reviewing content. 
So I, I mentioned numbers, but just in the last quarter, we removed over 4 million pieces of content for being tied to organized hate, so hate-based organizations. And I think it was something like 8.7 million pieces of content related to terrorism. So tons comes down, but when you find something, it means you're seeing where there's a gap. It means you're seeing something we missed. So that's why these partnerships are crucial. Um, yeah, maybe Aries, one more you, question and then we'll move yeah. on to examples. I think that in this context of language, there is a question about bad grammar that uh, Alan says he knows it sounds ridiculous, but most of the hate speech we see on Facebook posts are extremely badly written, but the message still gets through. Well, that's, I think that's the reason why you need native speakers. So if a native speaker is looking at it, the bad grammar doesn't make a difference. That's why, again, even though I think I'm pretty good at French, I should not be the one looking at French language content. Um, and so that's why those teams, and actually those teams proactively flag things to policy teams. So I can say just the other day, the, the market team that looks at Bahasa was flagging things to us in Indonesia because certain slang terminologies were being used through Islamist extremist groups to carry out attacks. And so sometimes it's just our market specialists, it's not even external stakeholders, but those people that are looking at the language trends are able to see how people are shifting and using different words and trying to evade detection. Um, so that's a constant feedback loop. The job is definitely never done, but it's those sorts of conversations that help us get better. So I'm gonna, I know that we have quite a lot to get through and I'm gonna leave another section for questions at the very end. Um, but I'm going to reshare my screen because I'm gonna give you all four examples. And the point of this is for you to deconstruct these four examples. So you'll go into breakout sessions and you'll be, each of you in one breakout session will take one example and kind of just tear it apart. And so the point in your breakout session will be to answer a few basic questions about the content and recognize that this is how people will be looking at your content when you put things out there. They're gonna wanna know who started this, is it legitimate, does it feel authentic, is it working? And so you're gonna try to tease this out as you go. Um, so if I'll, again, Vesna, I'm gonna lean into you to help me to see if you see my slide. Yes, I do. Okay. Work workshop on counter speech campaigns, yeah. Great. So I'm just gonna talk you through four examples and they will be as such. So if you do have a pen and pencil or you're taking typed notes, just write down one, two, three, four, and then you'll know when you get into a breakout group, which one is your example. Um, and at the end of this, we will come back together and really what I'd like, and if it's hard to do the voice chat, I'd like to go group by group and maybe in your group, you can even pick a designated speaker to talk us through what you found out about the campaign. So the first one, and all, again, all of these have kind of different geographic scope, different types of extremism they might be targeting. The first one is called Exit USA, and it is attached to an NGO called Life After Hate. So example one, that's all I'm giving you, Exit USA, Life After Hate. Example number two is Extreme Dialogue. And in the image, you get a little bit of at extreme dialogue, so that might help. Example number three, we stand with Manchester, and it has a date on it, so that already gives you some indication of things. It has some flags, so maybe take note of that. And example number four is Jihad de Mort, Turn to Love. Now, these are all very different campaigns um, and you'll probably be able to garner some very strange and different insights about each. But here are the questions I want you to think through in your breakout sessions. So one, I want you to explore what platforms you can find these on. So where do you see it? Is it on Twitter? Is it on YouTube? Is it on Facebook? Is it on some other platform? Does it have its own website? What mediums are they using? So is it video, audio? Is it through artists? Is it through peer-to-peer -peer networks? Who do you think that they're trying to target? So who would be their ideal audience? Is it broad? Is it really specific? Who are they trying to reach? There might be more than one. Maybe some of their content is trying to reach one audience, some is trying to reach another. 
what is the aim of their counter speech? So what is their theory of change? What is their goal? Can you tell what their goal is by the campaign and content out there? Based on that, does your group think that the counter speech is successful or not? And then how, how is that success measured? Are you looking at it because you saw YouTube videos and you wanna see that they had a lot of views? Are you seeing that it's a website and the website looks really bad or really good? So what does success look like? Erin, there is a request uh, from the organizer to repeat the, the campaigns for the audience once again. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, here's the questions in the chat thread. And then I'm gonna write down numbers one, two, three, and four. So you can go uh, through and you can just see it in the chat and copy and paste that if that's helpful to you. So one again is exit USA slash life after hate. The second here is going to be extreme dialogue. And again, it's whatever you can find. So there's no fail here. It's kind of an exploratory exercise, recognizing that this is how people are gonna look at your own content out there. And it kind of humbles us sometimes. Um, the other is we stand with Manchester. And the last one that I highlighted was Jihad Damore. Okay, so now I'm gonna lean into the other Aaron on this call to help us break you out into chat sessions. And I think probably take 20 minutes in those sessions to try to get through. So don't take more than a couple minutes on each of those um, questions. And depending on if you are being called to workshop one, two, three, or four, you will only have one counter speech campaign to tackle. Yeah. Okay, tell me there were some more, you know, comments or questions. Do you want to get back to them at the end? Um, there is a yes. question before asking about radicalization on your platforms. Does each platform, does it only known or you have some kind of collaboration? There is also a question about taxonomy of, or classification of radical groups. Yeah. Okay. Some more. Mm -hmm. Maybe we, I can, maybe as people are joining in, I can get to those questions really quickly, knowing it'll take people some time. So if you are dialed in, lucky you, you get the answers. Um, but I, 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 yeah. Sorry, I will head over to the sessions and start uh, bringing people back. Okay, great. great. Okay, I'll be back. So for those on the call, there were a couple questions we didn't get to. Uh, Vesma is gonna help me stay true to them and make sure we touch upon it. Um, and again, make sure your questions are related to counter speech or dangerous organizations and those types of policies. There are just so many other teams that cover other types of harm topics at Facebook. So I wanna make sure that I can be the one to answer to them. One was about taxonomies of different types of violent extremist groups and how we deal with that at Facebook. I mean, first and foremost, we look to certain lists like as a US company, we're obliged by the US designation and sanctions lists just legally, but also more broadly, we look a lot at things like the European Union designation lists, um, as well as the United Nation designated entities lists. So there are some larger and international bodied lists that we can lean into. But if anyone studies radicalization, first and foremost, you will notice that that mostly in all of those lists focuses on Islamist extremist terrorism. Um, so that's going to have a blind spot to domestic terrorism usually. So usually government lists do not include barely any, maybe one or two entities that relate to neo-Nazism or white supremacy. Um, I would say maybe the German government is the best at labeling hate band groups more than other governments, but there's very little to go off of. So for us, if a group fits our behavioral criteria and that criteria is open on our community standards, then we would look to label that group as a hate-based organization or as a terrorist organization based on their behaviors. And then we go around the world with different teams and teams will submit groups to us. We work with NGOs. We look at different lists that NGOs have put together as well, and that helps define it. We've even, especially for trends we're seeing now, uh, we've worked with academic groups like the Center for Analysis of the Radical Right 
who did an entire paper just about symbols, slogans, and slurs of the white supremacy spectrum so that we make sure that we're on top of it. And then things like partnerships around misogyny-based violence. So we just increased a partnership in Canada with an institute that looks at incel and volcel communities. So these are some of the things that we do. So that speaks a little bit to that question. And then Vesna, you said there was another question that I hadn't gotten to. Uh, yeah, there is one more question about uh, artificial uh, intelligence, how much it is involved in detecting hate speech and radical content. Yeah, so anyone interested in data and metrics on that sort of thing, I encourage you to look up what we call the Community Standards Enforcement Report, and maybe I can even try to look for it now as we talk, Facebook, Community standards enforcement report. And there's a specific section on dangerous organizations, but there's also separate sections on hate speech. So there, I just pinged the link to the group for the session. And if you're interested, dive into those numbers. So these come out, the community, it's basically the Facebook transparency report that comes out quarterly, which is a big lift. So it comes out every three months and it talks you through content, what it was removed for. So you'll notice that just at the end of 2019, we started removing, we started labeling and being transparent about removing content for being organized hate. And again, there's a separate section on hate speech. So have a look at those numbers. It also gives transparency around appeals. So we are open and transparent about how much content was appealed. So sometimes we get it wrong at scale. Um, it's very hard for things like humor and satire to sometimes know the difference between what is actually violent content and what is maybe in bad humor but still shouldn't be removed um, and things like that. So it, it says how much was appealed versus how much was reinstated. An interesting thing if you are a data geek is that you will notice that less content is appealed than is reinstated and that is because there's an amplification effect. So if there was one magazine satirical comic that was taken down for hate speech but actually was an error it just takes one person flagging that to appeal and if it's reinstated that could lead to a hundred or a thousand posts being reinstated because we will do it based on the fact that okay that image is not violating so that should be reclassified so just one person flagging it could lead to multiple pieces of content being reinstated um i think with that we have most of our guests back and thank you for these questions uh, I will try to, again, follow up with quite a few different links to share around if helpful. But in the meantime, I think maybe we just go group by group and it, get ready to just uh, request having audio. And what I'd love is one representative for each group to just talk through what they found and quick fire in two to three minutes what they thought of the campaign based on the questions I asked you guys. So uh, for working group one, so the person that looked at Exit USA, Life After Hate, if someone could request to speak on behalf of that group. I don't know, Aaron, if you're seeing as tech support somebody requesting. Um, yeah, no, not yet. So uh, whoever's in group one, if you can, perfect. Fernanda, I see you. I hope there was perfect. no one else wanting to. Ah, do you hear the echo? It, it's pretty minor. So I would say just push through okay. if you can. So um, they are using Facebook, um, Twitter, and Instagram, also their website, and they have a documentary on Vimeo. We thought they were on all the platforms that were relevant for their uh, purpose. Uh, we thought they could use, uh, at the beginning, we thought they used little um, images, only images and not so much video, but then we realized they do have uh, a lot of a section full of videos so they have uh, a good mix of media um, with we think their audience is to rehabilitate people that used to have this uh, hate um, activities and they they work to, with compassion as a big word and we think it works for the purpose that they that they pursue and also, I mean, they have these um, success stories, which take bravery and build on the compassion. They talk about the families surrounding these uh, people that are getting rehabilitated. They have a lot of uh, click-through things that they could use as measurement. And they also uh, have numbers of people that they've helped and that they also become activists or 
help in the organization, which are also good measurements. And we found out that they got a big grant. Uh, so that shows success as well. <laughs> so um, all in all, we thought it's, uh, it's a great website, well structured and pretty much the, the different channels work well for the, the big idea and, and the message comes through. I don't Perfect. know if someone else in the team wants to add anything. <laughs> Anyone else from the team want to add into that? Yes, if you request, I will accept, I promise. And, and, and if someone does, Fernanda, that's perfect and succinct. I mean, some things to point out is, one, that you as a consumer are also very visual. So the fact you're like, oh, the website looks professional enough. Oh, they have metrics very openly and transparently that tell you that they're a success and why. So for your NGOs as well, how am I going to interface if you're asking for a grant or you want to... Uh, tell somebody that you're successful, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to look at your website. They might not look at your social media as much, um, but it's about kind of how, what indicators are you giving people that you work? Um, and you're right, they're, they're more on the downside of the spectrum. So they are working on disengagement. Uh, they are working on bringing people out from neo-Nazi and white supremacy networks in the US. Um, and so that's, I think you kind of pointed out all the different things you could find just by doing some searches around the group. Um, and, and that for you, that seemed like they were doing well and that they came off as successful. We are all very basic and visual. So the second I click on a news link and the website looks bad, I click off. Because I'm like, oh, that probably means it's cheap. It doesn't have funding. Now, it has never been cheaper or easier to make a pretty good looking website. But you, you see how somebody could also, as the previous question, just by having a sexy looking website, you could also mislead people. So if someone just focused on having an attractive website, in our heads right now, the better the website, the more truth it conveys. So we have to be very aware of our own biases. Um, but in counter extremism, we also need to be aware, having something physically look better and look credible, where all these little Sherlock Holmes questions are going off in our head when we review third party content. Um, for the sake of time, and Fernando, maybe jump back into the Q&A at the end, but for the sake of time, do we have anyone from working group two that wants to talk? So that was extreme dialogue. And if anybody been... else is in that group, go ahead. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Hey, cool. Alan. Hello. So uh, about our group, well, we were a couple of three. So <laughs> uh, this is uh, some questions. So uh, what platforms, everything. Everything was covered, uh, uh, except, I don't know, Instagram, maybe. So uh, unfortunately, everything's dead. So uh, the last update was like two years ago. And for that, it was uh, going strong with three years consecutive. So uh, about uh, memes, uh, this is very visual. So uh, it, it used a lot of videos, uh, YouTube videos, uh, of course, and uh, uh, then we posted it on uh, every platform. Uh, and uh, of course, workshops and uh, news articles uh, on their uh, website, there's actually about us uh, in the media. And uh, just load it. BBC, TTS, Deutsche Welle, uh, iNews, Huffington Post, and uh, The Globe and Mail. Uh, Target audience, well, uh, there's a broad spectrum, but uh, as far as we could see, the, the majority of their target audience was uh, young people and schools to target uh, radicalization. And uh, then, if I, I'm too fast, just uh, say to slow me down. No, you're good. Uh, what is the aim of country speech? Well, uh, in yeah, in their own words, our aim to uh, is to equip practitioners with absolute confidence and uh, a means of answering difficult questions through a series of structured educational resources. Uh, are you being successful? But, well, uh, we answered uh, not enough data but to answer objectively because it ties to the next question. How would you measure your success? Well, how do you measure success? Well, uh, there is not enough data to uh, quantify success. 
less, although uh, positive feedback and presence of plethora of, uh, on plethora platforms might be considered uh, considered an uh, indicator of success. That's it. Great. Well, uh, if anybody has anything to, yeah. So I know that anybody I know else. That your cable connection group. was a little fuzzy, but I think I got the gist of it. And I'm very good at reading fuzzy yeah, messages sorry. working for Facebook. No, no, it's OK. It's not your fault. And so what I got from that, and I think you're completely right, that there was a lot on the platform, but a lot of it seemed dated. So they had their social media bases covered. But now yeah. you're seeing this kind of big gap. Um, this is very normal, by the way, with when you see NGOs getting a funding cycle where they do one project and then the project comes to an end and then it goes kind of dead afterwards. So think about that for your own social media preferences. Do you yeah. put a post saying this is on pause? Do you give an indicator? Do you remove the channel from existing if the program doesn't exist anymore? These are things to consider because it sometimes can work against you when you had a great program, but now it's over. So how do you indicate that? Um, lots of video content. You are completely right that the target audience is teachers and students. Um, and what, but maybe what's not always clear is that this was meant to be a program that is taught in schools, and that you're training teachers of how to ask questions of young people about extremist histories and stories. So you're using personal narratives to talk to students. You're using the stories of former extremists and survivors of extremism, whether they survived attacks or had personal effects because of it. And so some of that, maybe their elevator pitch gets a little bit lost sometimes. Um, but it, you're right that in most, most campaigns that are available to public, it's very hard to know what success is. So what would be great is if they had a report that either gave a summary of their findings or talked about how many students or teachers were helped. And you'd need a little bit for this sort of thing if you're teaching young people, maybe a little bit of a qualitative analysis over time. Like, did you find by the end of the school year conversations changed with young people. So you're raising all the right questions. Um, again, they had it flashy, slick, good content, but maybe a little bit more to give an audience a sense of what success looked like, and also maybe to convey to the audience that the program's not running anymore. Uh, and so again, there's a lot of outdated counter speech. Not all counter speech is meant to last forever. Um, thank you for that overview. I think it hits some of the points we're trying to land really well. We don't have much time left, so I'm going to move on. Um, is there anyone from working group three to give kind of like quick fire 60 to 120 second overview of We Stand With Manchester? Great. Please correct me on the pronunciation of your name. <laughs> yeah, it's fine, uh, okay. Jana. Uh, so our uh, organization, our pro um, the project we were working on uh, is named uh, Jihad Amur. And, um, it it worked on a few different platforms so they had a facebook page a twitter account a youtube account and a website as well which is no um, no longer up as well as uh, a book uh, created by the um, by the um, the star the person who started the movement um the media they used mostly were um videos as well as um, tweets uh, facebook posts uh, and also the book that uh, we mentioned before so the uh, the main um, the main medium was uh, was a visual one um the target audience uh, is mostly the muslim community but also um it broadly targeted the western communities that uh, that these muslim communities were part of uh, spreading a message of understanding and empathy um quite, uh, quite just western communities as um, in in a broad sense uh, the aim was uh, for um, the initiator to spread a message of love using his personal uh, experiences. Um, also um, encompassing um, reappropriating the term of jihad, which has many uh, mainly negative uh, connotations, and humanizing others, stigmatized communities, and individuals. Um, when it comes to the success, uh, the 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 original video in French got about a million views, but the others uh, didn't um, didn't really reach a larger audience. So um, it's it's difficult to measure to measure the success of the movement 
the number of followers on the Facebook page was quite small, about 14,000 and about 70 on Twitter. So it was really mostly the French video uh, which uh, which had uh, the which reached the larger audience. Um, so perhaps it didn't um, it it didn't uh, it didn't uh, really uh, gain momentum at that time, and. Um, Perhaps that's due to the reason that uh, the goal wasn't really clear or very specific. It was just uh, um, a message of love, but since it wasn't very, very targeted, there seems to be no activity on the Facebook page after uh, 2018 um, and on Twitter as well. And along the website is, uh, is no longer active. So perhaps it was just a, a temporary, um, initiative which and the initiator uh, moved on to something else since then that's a fantastic summary uh, and i think you hit the nail on the head and and this goes a little bit to the we stand with manchester i know we didn't have somebody sign on for that and we're running out of time increasingly but the point of this is that you see oftentimes you might get one piece of content that hits all those into it's timely it's succinct it gets a lot of views because it's of a moment you can imagine that this is a french speaking audience if it's called jihad de Mour. this is in the aftermath of a lot of attacks that had happened in paris when you're talking about the time zone for which you see most of the activity taking place um, and then because of the success of one video they wanted to scale out and do all this stuff but actually they'd kind of hit home with this one video and they tried to franchise off of it that didn't have as much success so we also see this, uh, we stand with Manchester, for those of you that don't know what it is, it was a, a concert that came together after the attack on an Ariana Grande concert in Manchester. And again, it was about creating one moment around one cause to bring people together. Um, and there, I think the point of this is that some sometimes counter speech is meant to be sustainable. If it's a disengagement program, if it's an educational program, that is on the prevention and the counter side of the spectrum. But a lot of times counter speech is a reaction to real world trauma or events that a certain society is facing. So whether that is the aftermath of Charlie Hebdo. And again, if I say, if I use hashtag Je suis Charlie on a post today, it's not gonna mean as much as it meant a few years ago. So not all counter speech is meant to be sustainable. Sometimes you're hitting deep and hard in a moment that's meaningful. Other types of counter speech are meant to be sustainable and engaging, but a lot of NGOs don't always clarify what their goals are. Um, and so those are just some things to take away. Everything that we just discussed are ways that people are going to be judging what you put into the online space as well, whether implicitly or explicitly. Um, and so this training is kind of meant to help you work backwards and deconstruct other people's counter speech to kind of reflect on what tips you might take away then when you reflect on the type of work that you wanna put out in the online space. And so with that, we'll wrap up, but if you do have further questions, just harass Aaron and he will email me and I will try to get some <laughs> links to send you, but I'm putting that burden on him. Um, and I'm happy to send out a lot of the links that I mentioned and more things around safety, security, Facebook links to transparency reports and all the rest.